I'd first like to take a moment of silence because these six names I'm going to announce are African American unarmed males that were killed in the last six weeks by cops. The last six weeks, six African American unarmed males were killed by people who were supposed to serve and protect us. Rest in peace to Dante Parker, Kayame Powell, Eric Garner, Ezel Ford, John Crawford, and Michael Brown. Thank you. I'd like to open with this is not a comfortable conversation to have. My mother is fully Irish, short, little redhead woman, and my father is this tall, beautiful, Nubian, African-American man. I am so happy to have many races run through me. So this is not a comfortable conversation to have. I'm literally stuck in the middle. Amen. But we've been living comfortably too long. There have been festering issues, and we, live, we have lived under a cloak of blissful ignorance, whether we wanted to or not, for too long. So I'm first going to present you with the problem. There are lots of problems here. And plenty of people are presenting you with problems, but I'm going to present you with numbers and facts, and then I'm going to present you with the solution, because that's necessary. If we keep pointing fingers and we keep pointing out the problem, we're just pointing out the problem for years and years and years, like we have been for centuries. So I'm going to offer up an, a, a solution for all of us, but most importantly, Caucasian American people. It's time for all of us to come together no matter what color you are, it's important for us to take this into consideration as if Michael Brown were your own son. Amen. Your nephew, your brother, your cousin. I've been there. I'm down there in Ferguson. I've choked on the tear gas and run from the bullets. And I'm a peaceful protester. Amen. I've been threatened by officers. I know the woman in that, in that, with that sign. I know her. There's another, there's another image that's going around the world of a friend of mine who picked up the tear gas and started to throw it back. It's a powerful image because we're angry. I am the angry generation that my fathers, my aunts, and my uncles walked for this peace that's not there. Amen. So something has to happen. Did you know that Michael Brown was shot four times with his arms up before he was shot twice in the head? So I have somewhat of a problem. I appreciate the... The, the outlook of that officer who's also an African-American, but I have somewhat of a problem with his outlook because I'm not, I just can't wrap my mind around how his life was threatened. One person was armed, one person was not. And I know that officers are also trained to detain a suspect. I didn't know that the sentence for possibly, allegedly, because it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. Amen. I didn't know that allegedly stealing cigars meant that he could try, he could arrest, try, sentence, and execute Michael Brown all in a matter of minutes. I'm sorry. I didn't know that that's how it worked. Did you know that Michael Brown's body laid in the street, his blood stained the concrete for four and a half hours and no ambulance was called? Did you know that they put his body in a black SUV? Did you know that his mother was told to settle down while she watched her son's body rot in the street? Did you know that they whisked away the cop and it was never called in? The shooting was never called in. The news called in the shooting. The shooting, he never called for backup. He never said that shots were fired. The shooting was never called in. Ferguson police officers had no idea somebody was shot. There's a problem. Did you know that 4% of law enforcement agencies, only 4% of law enforcement agencies report police-involved shootings to the FBI database? And those are the ones with people who are armed, the ones that are justified. 4%. So out of these six that died in the six weeks, Imagine the ones we have no idea about. 
As an African American, we are historically and still guilty and proven, until proven otherwise. And I say otherwise because being black is a guilt in itself. And that's the truth. That is the unfortunate truth. I've grown up in a world where I wasn't black enough and I wasn't white enough. So I've, I've gotten it from both sides. So I speak to you from full experience here that there's got to be a change. There's a real deep-rooted issue and it's time to make a change. Amen. We are literally divided in half. 50% of Americans believe officers generally aren't held accountable for misconduct. 50%. Now, I don't have the racial uh, outlook there, but 50% of Americans, I don't care who you are, believe that officers are not held accountable for their misconduct. And I was going to read the statistics that my father just played that even though we are stopped more, pulled over more, it seems to be that Caucasian Americans are more likely to have the drugs on them because they're not suspected, so they're not detected, so they're not punished. And it's important to know that there's a racial issue, but it's important to become colorblind because until we stop seeing you as a white male and a black male, then we will see just that forever, a white male and a black male. You are a man, and you are a man. You are both human beings. Where is the value for human life? Kayame Powell, I watched the video of his death. I have it. It was all recorded on a cell phone. Two officers and a man with a butter knife who was allegedly mentally ill, screaming, shoot me, shoot me, he stole two sodas out of a convenience store. Both officers unloaded six bullets apiece in his body in front of everyone because they felt threatened for their lives. And I'm so sorry, but let's just hit reality here. If I'm one police officer with a vest, another police officer with a vest, I highly doubt one of us is going to let this guy with a butter knife get to the other one and kill them. I highly doubt their lives were in severe danger there, where they both had to fire six bullets in this young man's body over two sodas and a donut. Where's the value for human life? I understand that, that officers are trained to shoot to kill, but it's funny because in Germany, they're trained to shoot to detain in the leg like it can happen sometimes, or tase, or pepper spray. Or, you know, they go through lots of physical training. I thought they were strong enough to hold somebody down, at least two of them, against one young man who wasn't very big in his build. Michael Brown was bigger than he was. And there was two officers there. We, in St. Louis, rate number 15 on the list of cities and states. We rate number 15 in the most black, white, segregated places to be. We are in middle America, and boy, oh boy, does it show. <laughs> I see tons of posts because I am the generation that invented Facebook and tweeting and Instagram, so I'm all over it. I have seen tons of posts about how sad depression and suicide is after Robbie Williams died. And I can't tell you how many people I've seen dump a bucket of ice over their head for the ALS challenge. <laughs> but when it comes to the Michael Brown posts I see, they're disheartening to say the least. Mm -hmm. And only beget a racially divided mindset, whether they mean to or not. So I think it's important to understand that my Caucasian family must try to understand first that they won't ever know what it's like mm -hmm. to be an African American. And you must understand that first. So, while I admire the blissful mindset that is, that is, it's not possible for somebody to just shoot for no reason. My sister on my mother's side is, is white, and I have two. You know, I have a white niece and a white nephew, and we talked about this yesterday. And he said, "Well, I just—he's 13 years old." Said, "I just don't understand. I don't think he would just shoot him for no reason." 
I admire that mindset because he wants to believe that that's not the world we live in. He had to be doing something, right? Yeah, we want to believe that. No. We want to. Yeah. And I admire that. And I said, I love that. I love that mindset. And I hope that passes on to our children and my children's children so that it can be true. But I said, I got to take you right here to the real since you said it. Unfortunately, that does happen. And that's the problem. So one of the most insensitive comments that I've heard is, well, black people kill black people all the time and you don't see any marches for that. Here's where I'm going to correct that statement. There is a Stop the Violence campaign that goes on in St. Louis that we don't hear much about. It's our elders that march for these kids to get out of the gangs, mm -hmm. to get out of poverty, to stop hurting each other and killing each other. We do that. We do have marches and campaigns against that, but we don't make national news, and that's okay, because we're trying to heal our communities. That's fine. But I want you to know that that's happening. So that's wrong. And it's also insensitive to say, because when black people kill black people, or a black person kills a white person, there's justice for that. They're usually arrested, not whisked away to another state while his body lays in the ground. Maya White. I don't know if you've heard that name, but she's a young lady that was shot in the head protesting. I see heads nodding, that's my cousin. She was protesting peacefully on her way back to the car when cops started shooting in the crowd. The media will tell you that there were two incidences and they wanna meld it into one. One was a drive-by and one was Maya being shot in the head. Two separate instances. Some wonderful neighbors picked her up when she realized, oh crap, I'm bleeding from my head. And, and, and how she's not dead, how I've survived three strokes and how she survived a shot in the head says a lot about the favor over my family and I thank God for that. Amen. Wow. Amen. So they took her to their house and it took three phone calls to 911 before cops mm -hmm. arrived, guns drawn, questioning the homeowners, yeah. how long have you been here? Yeah. Do you own the home? Excuse me? Could, could you take me to the hospital because I, I'm, you know, I'm alive now, but I'm not sure where this bullet is. Or could you get it out if while you're here? That is the response. I, I, I thought that I thought that one, it shouldn't take more than one phone call. And then when they got there, I thought that there would be an emergency response to the physical aspect of what had happened to somebody. Then when she got to the, uh, the hospital, we, she was blacklisted, we couldn't see her. They were going to postpone taking the bullet out of her head, but the doctors were like, that's, that's crazy, officers, sorry. We're gonna take the bullet out of her skull. And then they took that bullet for forensics or for, for evidence. I'm inclined to believe they took it to cover up because nobody's, nobody's contacted her for a statement yet. Mm. Wow. Mm. Now, here's a personal experience, because while that's my family, I didn't get shot in the head. My father and I, about two years ago, and I asked for your prayer here, because my brother and his wife, they are a mixed couple, couple my, my brother's black and his wife is white, they're suffering from addiction to very hard drugs. We took their daughter in, my niece, to give her stability, so that her hair would be combed, so that she would be fed, so that she would go to school. The basic needs she was not getting at home. We took her in and I basically raised her. I'm only 26 years old, but I had no problem with that. My father and I did what we needed to do as a family. And we didn't want to keep her from my brother and sister-in-law. That wasn't, that, that wasn't our intent. We wanted to make sure that she was safe and until they got the help that they needed. So one weekend when we had agreed that they could see her and take her and bring her back, they brought her back and they were on something clearly. And they brought her back and her mother said, well, I think it's okay if she stays out of school one more day. My father, who wrote his own master's at Webster University, said, no, that's not okay. She's gonna go to school and you guys can keep her all spring break, that's fine. Well, that really upset her. And so she started talking very disrespectfully to my father. And I am somebody who believes I was put on this earth to protect him. So <laughs> I kindly told her to pipe down a little bit. And that made her even more angry. 
so she attacked me. While her hands are around my neck, my father's trying to get her off of me. What does my brother do? He attacks my father. There's now a very large fight going on here, and I get her off of me enough to tell my niece to call the police, because she's watching it. The police get there, and by this time, my brother and his wife are outside. They talk to them first. Then they come into our house and say, well, she said that you attacked her first. I'm sorry. Do you see her fingerprints still around my arms and neck? Do you see where I'm bleeding out of the side of my mouth? Because she's untouched. Well, ma'am, you're all going to be charged for disturbing the peace. Excuse me? I called you. We called you as homeowners to come and help protect us. And now we're all charged with disturbing the peace? My father had to calm me down at that point because I was turning into somewhat of a rebel. And he didn't want me to get arrested for more than disturbing the peace. So he wrote us all a ticket for disturbing the peace. The court date came and the judge said to me, to us all, are you guys okay now? And I said, I mean, as okay as we're gonna be. And she was like, what? And my dad was like, yes, we're fine. We just want to get out of here. Let's just go. And she said, you do understand that police have better things to do than settle your family issues? Oh. What? There's a problem. We have a problem of an underlying conscious and some subconscious disease called racism. An increasingly clear police upstate rising. So... When you can't tell the difference between the police and the military, there's a problem. Because before they called in the National Guard, there were tanks rolling. Before they called in the National Guard, there was tear gas, which has been banned and labeled a chemical weapon back in the 1990s. I'll set that right there. Not all cops are bad. Not all white people are racist. And all, not all black people gangbang. So let's get to the solution. It's important that we learn about the history of our city and how it reflects the racial history of America. It's important that we use words that speak the truth about the disempowerment, oppression, and disinvestment and racism that are rampant in our communities. For example, the media outlets will tell you how much looting and rioting is happening. Let me tell you that that's a select few people. All of us are marching peacefully, praying with our feet, mm -hmm. arms up in the air. And there was recently a video released of an officer who I guess we gathered a little too closely. Too many of us came together and he threatened to kill us. It's important to understand that the media is not gonna tell you that I took my coat off to cover a girl in Ferguson that was too cold that I fed the business owners who were looted and picked up with my bare hands because I didn't have gloves and I'm a diva, so that's really big deal. That's a really big deal. <laughs> picked up trash with my bare hands. They didn't cover me. And that's fine, because I'm not here for the media. I'm not here for the opportunity. And we have plenty of those too, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> They're gonna show you what's gonna get them ratings. Did you also know that the officer Fox first released that the officer was uh, punched in the eye and may never see again. That was also recanted a couple days ago. So when they can't get their story straight, it's hard for me to believe because all the witnesses say the same thing. So I, I also have a problem with waiting for facts because I feel like there's been plenty placed in front of us. We humans are fed up with years of being terrorized by people made to serve and protect. I didn't think much of it while I was growing up. My best friend um, lived in the Canfield Apartments when we were in college. And um, she would always say, don't drive too fast. They're looking for a reason to pull you over in Ferguson. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And as a teenager, I'm like, I better watch my speed. But it brings a whole new meaning now. They're looking for a reason. This is a community who has dealt with years and years of being literally terrorized by the people made to serve and protect. 
And I pray that none of you ever have to be told to settle down while your baby's body lays in the street. I pray that none of you ever have to know what it feels like to watch them not call help. I pray that none of you ever know what it feels like to wait to bury his body because so many people are cutting into him to find an answer. Understand that there's a different kind of slavery, mass incarceration for profit. Be proactive in becoming an ally in your community. Don't be afraid to be unpopular. Don't give up. Understand that the past, understand the past to understand the present and realize the possibility for the future. People are literally dying now. We must all help if we hope to make it better for the next generation so they don't have to march the same marches I did, my father did, my grandfather did. I'm going to close with a prayer that I wrote this morning. Dear God, we first thank you for another chance to see, hear, smell, taste, feel, walk, and talk today. Yes, we thank you for hope, love, responsibility, and possibility. We all ask, we ask that you open our hearts. Let us listen with conviction so that we may know better and therefore do better. We ask that you lay protection over everyone here, that you infuse love into everyone here. Please, God, please, God, forgive us of our sins and make us move forth to do and be more like you. Order our steps and hold our hands as we move forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.